We were introduced to Peter. Peter, this bold and brash businessman, this learned, educated guy, this follower of John the Baptist and then follower of Jesus Christ. We learned a little bit about Peter. We learned about his call in John 1. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon, and tell him, we have found the Messiah. If you're reading along, page 23, sorry, for those of you who have guides. We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. He brought Peter to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Petros, Peter. Simon, upon meeting Jesus, is given a new name, Cephas, an Aramaic word meaning a stone. The passage in John includes that Greek word Petros. This is where Simon is first called Peter. Petra. If any of you know the, like, original Christian rock band, Petra. Oh, Mom has her hand up. Wow. Petra is aptly named. Rock. But Peter is not called Petra. He's called Petros, which is the capital of Arkansas. Little rock. Piece of rock. Small rock. Small stone. Petra, Petros. Okay? Okay. Petros, John Miller tells us, the Greek word for Peter, maybe my clicker doesn't work, you might have to guess, Nerissa, there we go. Petros, the Greek word for Peter, is derived from Petra, which means a rock such as stands out in the sea or on a beach, a ledge or shelf of rock, a rocky peak or ridge. This is an important distinction to make, as Pastor Drew actually mentioned this morning. There are some Christian traditions that make too much of Peter being called the rock. Right? We have the Catholics who build the papacy on Peter being the foundation of the church. Well, if you don't get this distinction between Petra and Petros correct, you're, you're led to some issues like that. When Jesus tells Peter in Matthew 16, 18, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Christ is telling him, you are Petros, and on this Petra I will build my church. John Miller also says, uh, upon what rock did the Son of God intend to build his church? Upon Peter? Petros? A piece of rock? Or upon Petra, the rock? The answer of every sincere heart must be not upon Petros, but upon Petra. Peter is, of course, an important part of the rock, but he's only one piece. And thankfully so, because Peter, as we acknowledged at the outset, he's too unstable to be the foundation. He's what we call the disciple with the foot-shaped mouth. Aside from probably the Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of the law, he receives more rebukes from Jesus than any other person. Is that the foundation of our church? Of course not. Our foundation, our cornerstone is Jesus Christ. Instead, the church is built upon an immovable cornerstone or capstone. A cornerstone is a large, flat stone. It's the first stone to be laid in a building project. And it determines the stability and alignment of the rest of the building. Peter, Petros, a piece of rock, is invited to be a part of that building project, as we are, built on the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ. Now, Peterman, Peterman, Peter is a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, and he understands the importance of rocks jutting out from the sea. Remember this story from Mark 4. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. These are educated fishermen. These aren't no slouches in the boat, but their boat is nearly swamped. Jesus in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up. Jesus got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. 
Then the wind died down and was completely calm. The Sea of Galilee was given to furious squalls that would rise up. So for these disciples, Peter included, being attached to a rock, something immovable, unshakable, was an important thing to understand. It was Paul who wrote, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And Peter, the fisherman, understands that an anchor is only as good as what it's anchored in. Well, Peter knows the value, the true hope that comes from being anchored in the rock. Now Jesus has called him to be a piece of rock, a beacon of hope for someone in need. It's Peter's mission to share the security he's found in Christ with people in need of hope. For only with Jesus are we safe in the storm. Only because of this firm foundation can we build lives of obedience and gratitude for what God has done. Remember to just two weeks ago when Pastor Drew took on the second chapter, what did we learn? This beautiful gospel presentation was the the first thing that Peter puts forward in his letter. We are chosen by God, elect, scattered, but united by the Holy Spirit, secure with an imperishable seed. It's lasting. God does the saving. God has us. God's done it. This is the gospel message that Peter can't wait to share with the, leader, the, the readers of his letter. And now, immediately following what God has done for us, First, he established what God has done for us. Immediately following, Peter sets out to articulate how and why we should live obedient lives. In light of God saving, now what? God has already saved and preserved, so we live lives of obedience. Commentator Wheaton, uh, all that follows in this letter shows how these great truths of the Christian life are to be lived out by those who believe them. As Peter gives practical advice, he constantly takes us back to the basics of the Christian gospel for the reason behind such behavior. The salvation described so magnificently in the earlier section can and should result in men and women living as followers of Jesus, no matter how difficult their circumstances may be. And so we read our next section, 1 Peter 1, 13 through 2, 12. Peter writes, inspired by the Spirit, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy. Because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house 
to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God the day he visits us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, you'll see uh, on this chart here that what we find in this section of Scripture is uh, a whole bunch of do's and do nots of the Christian faith. Things that we do and things that we stop doing. And if you would go peruse through uh, uh, the, the text that we just read, you'd notice that every time these sort of Christian living stuffs comes up, uh, put off malice and slander and envy and deceit. It always starts with a therefore. Therefore, prepare your mind for action. What is the therefore, therefore? The therefore is always there following some type of gospel presentation by Peter. In light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in light of the saving work of the Son of Man and Son of God, in light of what Jesus, your perfect sacrifice, has done to redeem you. Therefore, live this way. This is how we live in obedience because of what Christ has done for us. The word therefore implies a continuation of thought. Peter has just explained in in the, the text that we left off from last time, That the prophets had searched intently and with greatest care, and even angels longed to look into these things. Speaking of the salvation of man, what do the angels long to look into? Are they looking into what we've accomplished or, or what we're good at? Do you think angels are impressed by men and women? No, the angels are impressed by the wondrous thing God has done in saving fallen humanity. Therefore, We need to engage our minds to search and study. This takes discipline. This takes focus. This takes self-control. Careful, intentional study of this faith, this salvation, produces good deeds and right living. And so we have these do's and do nots of Christian living. The first uh, uh, evidence that that Peter gives here is, is... First citation is from Leviticus. Be holy because I am holy. And he gives all these references to the law, our lamb without blemish or defect or or the way handed down to you from your forefathers. See that section there? We're not going to get too deep into how the law works, but it's important to understand. And it's, it's actually very important as a defense of our faith that this is included in the New Testament, that Peter chooses to cite a book like Leviticus. You see, too many people decide that, well, the Old Testament is, is gone away. We don't need it. We, we have a new testament. We have a new covenant. So uh, all that is, is useless to us. So we just have to go by the New Testament. We, we don't need any of that law stuff. People say that. I hear that all the time. Even from Reformed believers. Hopefully none from this congregation. If so, I hope you're here and we can learn something. Yes, we have a new covenant in Christ Jesus, but it only makes sense if we understand the old covenant. You see, many heretics along the way, Marcion, maybe the first and most famous of them, tried to to write out the Old Testament. 
to say that that's stuff that we don't need. But what do you do with references like this in Peter? You can't understand the point that Peter's trying to make if you don't understand the role of the law and the Old Covenant. Even Jesus himself said, not one iota, not one, some, some translations say, not one jot or tittle of the law will pass away until he returns again. Jesus established a new covenant. He did not obliterate the law. Rather, he fulfilled it. Places like Colossians 3 and and Hebrews 5 in the New Testament tell us that the law is a shadow of the realities found in Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? The law is a hazy thing. Sometimes we read Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and we wonder, what in the world is God doing? Why can't I wear clothes woven of two fabrics? Well, that's a hazy shadow of a reality found in Jesus Christ. So does God care that we dress different than the world? Yes, he does. That's the reality we understand in Jesus Christ. And we have places in the New Testament, even in 1 Peter, that says, don't find your beauty in outward adornments. Rather, find your beauty on the inside. I hate these things. It never stays on. So the role of the law, the law still functions for us. Christ said so. But we have to understand it through the lens of Jesus Christ. And Peter's helping us do that. What is the stuff that has passed away? Why don't we get up here on Sunday mornings and make a whole bunch of sacrifices of lambs and bulls and catch it in the basin and sprinkle it on everybody? Why don't we do that? Well, we don't do it because we found our perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ. Why don't we go every day to the high priest and ask him to make atonement for our sins over and over and over and over and over again? Because we found a priesthood that's better than the priesthood of Aaron. That's better than the Levitical priesthood. Because Christ is the great high priest. And we can go to him who lives forever to mediate on our behalf. Is the Old Testament law gone? No. But it's understood through the fulfillment of Jesus Christ. Peter helps us understand that. And then he says, I'm flipping over to 29 if you're trying to follow along. He gets to his favorite metaphor. And what we started off by saying a a little bit, this Petra Petros thing that means so much to him. He says in verses 4 and 5, As you come to Christ, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be what? A holy priesthood, which we only understand if we understand the law and Christ's fulfillment of it. A holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, which we only understand if we understand the role of the law and Christ's fulfillment of it as the perfect sacrifice. But Peter, whose name is a constant reminder of this very stone, Petra, Petros metaphor, announces, See, becoming a kingdom of priests, it was impossible for our forefathers. It was this way of life that they handed down that was was useless to us because we couldn't be holy without offering sacrifices day in and day out. And, and even then we were unclean sometimes and, and clean other times. Then we'd become unclean again. It, it didn't work. But now, since Christ has been revealed, our great high priest and perfect sacrifice, we can all become a holy priesthood. Not because we're holy, but we get to build on the living stone, the one sacrifice that was perfect. And no sacrifice needs to be done again. This is Peter's main point. Jesus makes that kingdom of priests that at one time was just Israel bigger and better than we could have ever imagined. Because this time it's built on Christ himself and his sacrifice. And I think this is funny. It's, it's almost as if Peter gets ahead of himself. Because if you look at the verses that follow 4 and 5, Says, For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. Now, if I were putting this together, I would probably read that first. I would switch, what verses are these? I would switch verses 6 and 8 with 4 and 5. 
I would read the scripture, and then I would explain it. But I think this is a metaphor that, that is so close to Peter's heart, being that, you know, this is the name that Christ gave me. I'm, I'm the living example of this metaphor. Christ gave this metaphor through me. I'm the piece of stone built on the cornerstone. See, he, I'm the example. This is my story. This is my testimony, basically. And Peter gets excited and then has to go like, oh yeah, I got to explain to you what I'm talking about. See, back in this other part in Scripture, it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message. This stone, this cornerstone, this capstone, this rock is Jesus. Commentator Wheaton says again, By constant communion with Christ, the living stone, Christians will become like him. Living stones. By itself, a stone is of little use, but joined with others, it becomes part of a building. Peter is so proud, so proud to be considered a piece of rock. And his passion for explaining this idea is clearly seen in his urgency to share and his command of the scriptures that support it. He's actually used these scriptures before in a message uh, recorded in Acts 4. He had said to the people there, It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Christ is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. This is like a pastor's favorite analogy. I don't know if I have it. Maybe I do, and you guys can tell me. I don't know if Pastor Drew does either. But you, you know some pastors who have this, like, one analogy that they go back to all the time? Because it's just like this great thing that they discovered or this great connection that they made, and they just really like sharing that they understand this thing. This is Peter's favorite metaphor. He loves to get this in whenever possible because he is Petros, that piece of rock built on Petra. Peter is undeniably overjoyed, and rightly so, to share in that name given to men, Petros. We are all pieces of rock built into a spiritual house founded on Christ. But you'll notice that this text describes two kinds of people. Ones that are like the living stones and built into this, this building, this chosen people, this royal priesthood. Then there's also those who stumble over the stone. A harsh reality. That some are chosen and elect by God and others are, are destined to disobey the message. It's important to know what you're founded on, what you're anchored in. See, an anchor is only as good as what it's connected to. If you're out on the sea and, and you let an anchor down 10 yards, but the sea is 100 yards deep, you're anchored in water and your anchor is not going to do anything for you. Except for maybe tilt your boat one direction. Maybe you have enough line to get down to the bottom, but it's just muck or sand Sailors call this dragging. If you're not anchored in, in good enough bottom, strong enough winds will push you. Strong enough squalls, storms of life will, will move you out of where you want to be. But if you're fortunate enough to be anchored in a piece of bedrock, in a rock that stands out from the sea, you can know that you're not going anywhere. You'll have some jostling, some tossing and turning by the waves. You might get some water in the boat. You might even get wet. But you're not going anywhere. You can't stray any farther from that piece of rock than the line will let you. Peter tells us that we have this hope that secures. Or Paul had written, 1 Corinthians, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. The hope that secures the anchor 
is our hope connected to the rock, the immovable, unshakable, impregnable cornerstone, Jesus Christ, who will not let you out of his hand. We learn in the text from Peter today that we're born not of perishable seed. It doesn't fade away. This new life we've been given, it's not going anywhere. It's imperishable. And God will certainly carry us through. This is the assurance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. You're chosen and you belong to God. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, you're just Gentiles, right? We're, we're wandering around in darkness. We've got no hope. We're pushed around by every gust of wind. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. We noted in the last chapter that Peter has this high regard for the salvation of God. He's impressed by what God has done among men. This high regard for the gospel very closely informs how Peter wants to think about and do missions. When we get to chapter 3 of 1 Peter, we'll, we'll see it most clearly. Uh, he sets up sort of this framework for how we do, how we do missions. But, but he gets to it a little bit here. What Peter suggests here, and he'll talk about in specifics later, is that Christian living is the first step of Christian missions. If we don't live different than the world, how will they see God at work in us? By living lives full of hope, love, and security, and by doing good deeds in the sight of non-believers, they will have their hearts changed and believe before Judgment Day. Peter has written here that we live such good lives among the pagans that they will see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he returns. Live such good lives among the pagans. Peter does not advocate retreat from the world but rather entreats us to live good lives, gospel-informed lives, lives of thankfulness and gratitude to the God who saves us in the sight of the pagans, among the pagans. Live such good lives among the pagans that they'll see those good deeds and they'll glorify God on the day he returns. J.I. Packer, who, who died this year, a wonderful theologian, J.I. Packer wrote, Christians are to involve themselves in all forms of lawful human activity. And by doing that in terms of the Christian value system and vision of life, they will become salt and light in the human community. As Christians thus fulfill their vocation, Christianity becomes a transforming cultural force. This is how God has always worked. He's made himself incredibly available. Peter has cited here the law from Leviticus, be holy because I am holy. The system that God chose to implement back then was a familiar system. The sacrificial system was not anything new to the Israelites. Certainly distinct, certainly distinct in the way they practiced it, obedient to God, but it was not anything new to the nations in the ancient Near East. God chooses things that we understand. He reveals himself in ways to us. He reveals himself to us in ways that are accessible, understandable. He's made himself incredibly available. And when we receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and we live lives of obedience, the world sees that and says, That's a God I, I can be connected to. That's a rock that I can be connected to. That's a place I can put my anchor and know my hope is secure. The first step of Christian missions is to live such good lives among the pagans, but it's not the last. We live such good lives so that when they ask, we tell them of the hope we have in Jesus Christ. That though we're sinners... We're saved by the grace of the perfect, spotless sacrifice who died the death we deserved. He was perfect. He was righteous. He was also God and able to satisfy God's wrath and take it upon himself and yet raise himself to life again. And he now lives forever as our great high priest in perfect sacrifice. 
When we put our hope in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Holy Spirit works about obedience in our lives. If you have a booklet, there's a, a, a table on page 26. And when we did this with the high schoolers, I, I suggested maybe every morning if you would, would wake up and, and read that list, you'd be inspired to live lives of obedience. What are the things we're supposed to do as Christians? And what are the things we're supposed to avoid? Peter articulates that for us very clearly. Maybe we can live such good lives that people would see our good deeds and, and God would be glorified because of it. Amen. Let's pray.